Hi, this is Decentered Media, conversations about community-focused communications for positive social change. Hello, it's Rob Watson for Decentered Media, and it's the 23rd of November, um, and this is a, a regular update um, about community-focused communications, uh, or in other words, community media. And what I thought I'd uh, have a a uh, 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 short amount of 20 minutes or so maybe probably tend to go on a little bit longer than that just to outline some thoughts uh, about the the role of community focused communications um one of, it's it's interesting i was uh, uh, having some conversations um during the week with some colleagues who uh, run and manage a community radio station and one of the problems that we were talking about is how having uh, to deal with uh, communications professionals in health services local authorities public organizations businesses who don't have a clue don't have any any idea of what community media is about what it does why it does things in the way that it does things um so this is this is a a kind of uh, focus that i think is increasingly important is that an understanding of what the role is of community media and what the benefits are but also why it's different from other forms of of socially engaged media uh, and I, I use these terms are very loose and they need more precise definition but the the kind of observations and the the ways of working that um, come forward through community media that emerge out of community media practice are are distinct um, and th- there's sometimes there's I think there's my experience I'm fully prepared to accept that it's me, <laughs> you know, that I don't explain things very well and that I'm not in a position where I'm demonstrating and showing people how it works. However, uh, there is a kind of hesitancy and I think there's uh, maybe something in the culture at the moment uh, where uh, people who are working in established, mainstream, dominant, uh, industry-dominant, industry-focused practices and fields kind of don't want to see what's at the edges and what's at the peripheries because it might not be to their liking and it might push them out of their position that they're in at the moment or shift them in the hierarchy it's disruptive and we've seen this with the you know kind of kind of the artificial intelligence that is now has be, has, has you know, artificial ai machine learning has been around for a while uh, but it's this year particularly it's kind of dropped into the public domain it's pop popped into the culture and you can see that an awful lot of people are getting uh, 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 seeing the implications of this and starting to get worried. And nobody's really worried about community media um, replacing mainstream media. However, uh, there is a, a, a huge set of questions to be asked about uh, the kind of information and news that people get in a media world, and here in the UK specifically, uh, where the homogenization, the centralization, the corporatization of our media is kind of accelerating. And, and we see this with the media. I think in the last podcast, we talked about the media bill and the uh, consultation on the community radio order is the, um, the extent to which um, any... Uh, any uh, obligation to carry local and produce locally made programs to originate content locally and to, for that to be self-determined by everybody who lives in their town city neighborhood county wherever um it is kind of being erased out of the lexicon of broadcasting obligations and what we're left with is a kind of uh, uh a kind of barren landscape which is um you know we're, we're, we're allowing the supermarkets to be the only people who can dominate retail environments and what the supermarkets find most profitable is the mass-produced uh, products that are highly formulaic that are standardized that are efficient and are brand-led 
but which are of low nutritional value and which are you know kind of the same everywhere so that you know you walk into a supermarket pretty much anywhere in the world and the same kind of products have the same kind of prominence crisps crackers uh you know cereals um it's you know kind of it, it's a, it's a standardized largely a standardized kind of offer and the same is true of, true of our media that convenience form of media and the media bill reflecting on the media bill i kind of um uh, i'm actually a little bit more um uh, less settled about what the media bill is offering and i think now uh, i'm off the fence i think the media bill is a uh, there's a phrase I've come up with. What is it? It's um, it's like a, it's like land banking. You know, it's like the the housing uh, the, the the house builders. They're grabbing the land, but they're not doing anything with it. And what's happening is there's an asset stripping of the capacity of local communities to represent themselves, to speak for themselves, and to represent themselves to other people, and to, for that to be self determined on a geographical basis or a community identity basis or a community of interest basis <clears throat> so kind of what we're seeing and, and what the media bill uh, is is going to bring forward is a, a further homogenization a further standardization a further distance in you know uh, of products away from local communities yeah there'll be some elements there where local traffic information and news and updates will be cycled into the system but that's a bit like uh, you know kind of changing the label on the cart and, and saying that it's you know it's it's got some connection with local communities but it still comes out of a of a of a big factory and you know the it's a it's part of a an efficient news process information process rather than it being something which is a cultural expression uh, and it's rather than it being about identity and rather than it being about belonging now in making this uh, these observations, I'm obviously answering my own question, which is what is the point and purpose of community media? Well, you know, it, 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 I mean, it's a broad spectrum of things, but principally it's about self-determination and uh, articulation of uh, people's voices within uh, a, a, a civic society, which they are uh, part of and accountable to and uh, supported by. Likewise, it's those voices that don't often get heard, the ones that are most easily ignored, uh, those voices which are different, those voices and opinions where there's not, um, a, you know, accepted uniformity about consensus. Uh, there are aesthetic, cultural, uh, religious, um, you know, all sorts of reasons why belief systems, why people might want to express themselves. And the way that we're constructing the uh, legislative, uh, the regulatory policy for media and for radio looks like it's going to go down a route where there's going to be very little uh, diversity of thinking, diversity of expression and diversity of um, independent platforms. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think the challenge is the differentiation between community media and online social media because the answer typically would be well you know you can you can set up a YouTube channel here here I am I'm expressing my views on a podcast and I'm expressing my opinions on a YouTube channel and people are free to listen to my views and I can produce, produce this very cheaply and I get some reactions and it's like yeah that's fine uh, but there's something different about community media and that is that it's about it comes from it's about building a sense of community <clears throat> me talking online like this isn't really a sense it, you know, it doesn't manifest as a sense of community um well not the way i do it anyway <laughs> but they you know it it it's it's not necessarily something which is um uh generating a sense of belonging I'm, I'm interested in a topic i'm in, interested in a set of ideas uh, uh you know in my neighborhood i'm not talking about my neighborhood i'm not talking about the people who live 
uh, nearby. Um, I'm not talking about the kind of institution, public institutions, social institutions that we cohabit with and through. I, I'm talking about something very narrow, of very narrow interest. Whereas community media is something which is broader and it's, you know, it's about empowering and enabling and building the capacity for a sense of community. So it's that sense of belonging, it's that sense of identity. It's that sense of shared experience. It's that sense of uh, having some say within the uh, decision-making process, the governance process. And community media, community radio particularly, is the only form of media in the UK that has access as a legal requirement. And it comes out of the Everett report uh, and the first stage of community radio was going to be called access radio. And just the idea that, you know, it's, it's about people being able to, to having a right to getting involved, to go knocking on a door, entering into a studio and being part of with some training, with some support and all, all, all the other things that you have to do when you're running voluntary organisations. But it's a voluntary effort. Whereas our media, our professionalised media, I think is often, you know, most people, one, are terrified of, of approaching kind of media professionals. Two, media professionals see themselves as somehow different and separate from the population, in my experience. And, you know, it's about bridging those 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 gaps. And it's about uh, I don't like the phrase authentic uh, because I think, you know, kind of as they say, you know, once you've once you've learned to fake authenticity, you've got it made. Uh, I think there's something more. It's about the character of our society, the character of the individuals in it. Uh, and it's about the meeting the needs and having an assessment and an understanding of what is required in order for that group of people or that community, that society to grow and develop and to you know, kind of move forward and to reach, um, <clears throat> to have arguments, discussions, differences of opinion about where things are going, but for the voices within that to be, uh, respected. So I, I look at community media as, you know, as I say, I've adopted this phrase called community focused communications, which is very broad and agnostic. I don't care what m method you use to uh, engage and bring people together, as long as it's about bringing people together and it's about having a shared and common understanding and that kind of uh, culture we, we we don't you know there's a there's a need for a renewed focus in terms of cultural democracy i think in the uk uh we we don't regard you know if, if your culture is only provided by amazon netflix apple disney uh, that's not our culture that's a globalized culture what is our culture what are the things that we do locally that define us as who we are and so I was listening to a conversation on a podcast the other day, and it was a bit about uh, the the potential for, if you like, catastrophizing about the end of civilization. And if we, you know, there's a, a lot of you know stuff going on around the world that is 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 you know kind of weighing heavy on people's shoulders, and you know that can really kind of dominate our thinking and to say, and to think that there is no positive in the world when you know kind of we're, we're not seeing it at the moment maybe and uh the 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 the, the observation that was made was that well people don't want to see it they don't want to think about it the people are happy with their cars with their football um you know with, with, with posturing around the house doing things it's 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 it can often be a very parochial experience to live in modern western society here in the uk it can feel like that and our sense of engagement and collaboration with with, with other people is quite fragile and can be quite difficult and you know it it's we're not facilitating trust and again one of the kind of cliched phrases i use a lot is that uh, community media travels at the speed of trust and if nobody trusts our media and if nobody trusts our sense of community then it's not going to go very far at all. Uh, so it's all uh, what this boils down to is building up a sense of trust. And so I, I've kind of put some blogs together this 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 last week and had to think about uh, some of the kind of ideas that are rooted, I think, in the process or the the concept of this kind of community focused communication, which are useful for us to take into account um and 
I, I, I wanted to compare. I've, I've, I refreshed my memory of Jean Piaget, uh, who is a uh, early uh, uh, 20th century, was a French psychologist, and he was a developmental psychologist. And one of his arguments was that uh, we, you know, as children, the developmental process is that we have to learn to engage with the world. <coughs> Pardon me, let's have a sip of coffee. Um, and what we do is we go through a series of stages whereby we uh, engage with the world through imitation, we engage through the world through discovery, we engage through the world through abstract thinking. And what we're doing is we're constructing the world. And at the moment, there is a pushback against the notion of social constructivism. And I think it's slightly mistaken as to why that is. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure or informed about where it's come from. It's part of the kind of reaction against postmodernism or uh, post-structuralism and deconstructionism. Um, which to an extent I'm, I'm on board with as a reaction against. Uh, but the social constructivism model, I think, is is rooted in, and Piaget's uh, thoughts are rooted in something which is different, which is a kind of Kantian idea of, um, you know, we understand the world on the basis that we have a, um, a an ability or a capacity or a... a, a I was trying to think of the word that that is is used in Canterbury. <laughs> it doesn't spring to mind, but we you know we're, we're programmed is the wrong word, uh, but it's it's you know it's it's we can only see the world. We we don't experience the world in its raw form. We have to process that information, and it's called the the difference between the noumena and the phenomena, and the world as it is, and the world as we experience it, and we are wrapped up in our sensory experiences our intuitions and our rational thinking and what we do is we process that thinking along particular lines of logical in inference and deduction and we also experience the world through our sensory capacities to look at things and measure things and test things as well um, but that doesn't mean to say that we're actually experiencing the world as it as it is that is beyond our experience and I think where where often people think that is deterministic uh, or or idealistic, and it's it's kind of somewhere in the middle. It kind of combines the t combines the two. Um, so it's not purely down to what individuals uh, account for and and, uh, in, uh, and and kind of manifest dreams, fantasies, <clears throat> um, but there is a process there. And, and the, 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 the development and observation of how children learn is the manifestation of that process because it's not something that we uh, can do. Um, we, we have to go through that stage. We're not born with it innately uh, it, it firing off, if you like. It doesn't, it doesn't work from the get-go. Uh, it has to be developed through mature, you know, through, from infancy through to... Uh, maturity through adolescence and through into maturity uh, but the concepts drop in and function in a in a in a very universe universally applied way well universal as far as human uh, uh, beings go uh, so we engage with the world in terms of geometry and distance and being able to see and articulate things in, in the ability to think about cause and effect uh, and to be able to reverse engineer effect from cause or cause from effect, that kind of thing. And we we reach a developmental stage where we can work things backwards as well and we can, we can look at what the roots and uh, follow things backwards rather than just accepting things as they come forwards. It's very childlike things to just the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and to not be able to look at something and say well how did we get to this position well it was because of plus also and and this is the most the, the the point i was kind of trying to arrive at is the the notion that we we don't just see the world through uh, signs and signifiers as as indicators of you know kind of there's something present there we also see the world through a symbolic uh, framework and domain and the idea that something doesn't just have functional value in terms of 
its representational qualities but it also has something which is which goes beyond that so you know the, the this pen uh, that i'm holding um is uh it, it you know the image of the pen the words that the pen signifies an object it signifies a certain type of uh material object uh, but what it doesn't give you a sense of but what we uh, kind of live in the world of the, the you know we're, we're like fish swimming in this world is the symbolic importance it's penniness it's penness it's you know and it's it's you know the pe- the pen is mightier than the sword and its role and its use and it becomes a, a, a sign it becomes a symbol uh, which is the meaning is um is is layered with cultural meanings that have been accrued over thousands of years um and that we are able to uh to uh, you know we're able to connect what a pen does in terms of language and culture and communication and articulation of ideas and uh being able to uh arrest time and pass things on into generations simply because we're able to scribe you know inscribe things uh, and that's given us the gift of civilization. So what was wrapped into this sim- simple object that we look at and think, yes, that has a function, it leaves marks on a page. Uh, it has ink in it, this one has ink in it, and um, that it serves as a, a simple function. Well, actually, you know, a signature on, on, a, on a declaration can set a, a nation free, um, can appoint a, a monarch, uh, or confirm a monarch, and we saw King Charles getting frustrated at the pens he was using at his uh, one of his investi- investiture uh, ceremonies uh, last year. And you know th- this whole kind of uh, symbolic world is something that modern people are divorced from. Uh, modern uh, modern man, modern modern Western society. We're kind of decoupled from those older meanings, those older symbolic representations, and uh, because we live in a world of information overload, and we're expected to be able to sort and manage information. And this is one of the challenges about communication and community media: is that what we are, are, are you know, we we look at the use value of our media. Does it provide entertainment? You know. Actually, probably one of the worst things that happened in the 20th century was that uh, the BBC uh, adopted uh, Lord Reith's um, uh, guiding principles of inform, educate and entertain. Um, And that probably narrowed down the purpose of the BBC beyond what we really might have achieved with it um, because it then became about a process of uh, exchange it became about something which could be measured and weighed it you know the, the think of the difference between you know somebody who is building a cathedral in i don't know a thousand years ago uh Chartres cathedral or uh, ely cathedral and they didn't think you know what is the social purpose of this cathedral they wanted it to uh, be you know in a, in a society where literacy was 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 you know kind of very scarce what they wanted was to uh, you know inculcate a sense of wonder uh, that there is something that goes beyond the human experience what we've got is a modern communications model which is about um, giving us distraction or opportunities for distraction or giving us opportunities for information or giving us opportunities for entertainment and beyond that there is very little that uh you know is is designed to be uh awe inspiring and wonderful in the same way i'm not saying that it doesn't achieve that occasionally there's kind of kind of times when you go to the cinema and you get those moments and you listen to music and you get those moments and you're reading a book and you get those moments these it's it, you know that aesthetic experience but it's the general principles of social civilized communications have shifted and changed from that pattern of engagement 
which was about the numinous, uh, the the wonderful, the, that thing, that the transcendent, those things which go beyond our individual, personal, social experience, to those things which are purely about our tastes, our dispositions, our preferences, uh, and it becomes about us, and it becomes quite nihilistic in a sense. Now, I'm not. I'm not saying you know that we 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 can do very much about this. It's just the world that we're in. But having a sense that you know, kind of our you know, it's it's a very McLuhanite argument. You know, Marshall McLuhan. It's like we're constantly moving forward, but all we can see is the rearview mirror. We can only see what goes behind us, and and we look at ages in the past and think, well, you know, kind of this was doing something different. Um, and, and ascribing modern values to what people thought in the past is a fraught and dangerous uh, game. Uh, so we've got to keep moving forward. So this is where the kind of a, the focus, I think, for me is about this idea of um, community focused communication uh, has to get away from purely informational uh, exchanges, f- purely behavioural exchanges. And so I, I kind of uh, like to pigeonhole myself as a symbolic interactionist. Uh, not that I'm a very good one, um, because it, it's quite a difficult thing to to kind of put yourself in a position where you're kind of thinking about these things in that um, kind of multi-dimensional way of how do people how do people make things meaningful. Um, and that immersion within a society is overwhelming because you, 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 your, your people's sense of knowledge and reality and their learning and development and their focus uh, is, you know, kind of often just on getting through, you know, and we, we, you know, the priorities are to be accumulators of material uh, status and wealth and things like that. And that doesn't fit with the, the you know the the dreaming and the um, if you like the the, the more religious uh, or, or spiritual whatever phrase you want to use approach to uh, engagement and communication so it can really challenge uh, the way that we think about our forms of communication if we've got a different perspective on this so on the a blog that i've posted up about communication principles and symbolic interactionism is kind of i look at different aspects so materialism behaviorism symbolic interactionism kind of the symbolic social constructivism and ask some questions about that in terms of you know what is um what is the role of truth uh within uh, and knowledge within a symbolic uh form of communication as opposed to a material or rational form of communication and i'm not again i'm not going to kind of clarify this i'm not trying to say that we are choosing between one or the other we're doing these things on a you know at the same time consistently and and think of it in terms of logos uh eros and mythos uh, so we're, we're thinking about what it is that we our, you know, our rational thoughts are about our, ir, our our emotional responses to things, but then also the the symbolic the kind of the the the, 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 the kind of symbolic structures of things, which which do shape and change the way that we engage with one another in the world, because it shapes the way that we collaborate, and it shapes the way that we cooperate with one another to be informed by different symbolic frameworks or different symbolic traditions um where the kind of function of um thinking about communication makes a difference is that it kind of the the behaviorist model for example which i'm i'm not a fan of and i've moaned about before but we we saw a lot of the behaviorist type thinking in the pandemic of you just give people information you give them a nudge and they change their attitudes and behaviors and you know to some extent it works you know the we we, we've seen that the radio advertising for eat out to spread the virus the coronavirus was very effective and it spread the coronavirus uh that was uh you know uh, uh, unconsidered as the covid19 inquiry is uh is considering at the moment it was a a um a moment of kind of well you know rational thinking was overtaken by emotional thinking the need the feeling and the need to get things moving on 
uh, rather than looking at it and saying, well, hang on a minute. But also it, was, it overtook symbolic thinking because that kind of people respond to things differently. The values that people carry with them, although many are shared, many are different. And the kind of, you know, if you're addressing, you know, I always use this example, you know, and here in Leicester, we were in the longest lockdown in Europe and we've got a highly diverse population, super diverse city. And so to address people with one single symbolic framework or one functional behaviorist framework completely ignored and you know just didn't pay any attention to the needs of people who bring uh, other symbolic frameworks with them you know is it you know the the the, the fatalism that often can come with uh, some religions buddhism uh, hinduism um you know not particularly renowned for authoritarian uh, although societies can be quite authoritarian but the um uh, you know, it, as as a religious practice, it's not regarded as authoritarian, and you must do your 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 duty and your thing. Um, and so, different faiths, different belief systems have different symbolic uh, uh, resonances, and only communicating with people on one level uh, is limits what you your capacity to do things. And similarly, you know. Um, I suppose opening it up uh, too much can have a detrimental problem as well. So I think that the kind of I the the way I you know I'm I'm hoping to kind of develop this as a kind of set of practices which can be used by communications managers is ties in with. Uh, uh, you know, there's a number of questions that we can ask and it ties in with something which, which, which again I'm developing which is this idea of an equality impact assessment for communications and, and it, it's going to take some time to develop because I think at first hand it's quite functional and quite limited and you know the the Equality Act 2010 is is a very good guide uh, as to, in terms of what we can expect from an equality impact assessment in terms of protected people of protected characteristics so that's uh, uh, race um, uh, gender assignment um, sexual orientation um, pregnancy. Uh, those kind of things. I think it's 13 overall. <laughs> I've not got them to hand. Um, and the uh, and protected belief. So things like being uh, a, a vegetarian or being uh, gender critical. These are protected beliefs uh, and they've been through courts uh, in the UK. Uh, and, you know, kind of the, 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 there are protections there for people with values and ideas that are worth worthy of a democratic society i think is the phrase that's used um so within that there's a, a kind of combination of these two things in terms of figuring out which how does this work with different groups of people so you're kind of looking at the kind of cultural narratives that resonate like the archetypal narratives you know western society is dominated by the hero myth uh, it's not the only one there's the you know there's a number of uh, archetypal there's the redemption myth uh, there's also the um uh, which is the uh oh let's just think of the the you know the 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 uh, go to the uh, Faust, uh, the pact with the devil. Um, you know, these are the, the, the these each play a different role in society at different times, and we see these these uh, ideas, these mythological focus kind of comes and goes within our culture. Uh, but there's a current, you know, there's a theme, and it's consistent, and and it moves over slowly over time. Then you've got the impact is between the individual and the collective so this idea that kind of we are all in, in again western thinking is about being individuated individualized and uh you know kind of we can approach things on the basis that we're like calculating machines and that in a marketplace we make rational decisions as individuals which is kind of highly problematic when you look at patterns of behavior in groups and we're like a, he a, a herd and we follow you know we follow patterns of behavior and if other people are doing it well we'll do it as well so what do we mean by our individuality and you know it's it's a, a, there's always a tension between the two but then there's also the kind of the perceptions that we have between what we regard as being natural and what we regard as being of human 
construction so nurture and nature uh you know what is what are we adding to this ourselves and what is it we're finding in the natural world uh to what extent you know we are beings of the world we are animals um and yet we separate ourselves from the natural world uh, as no one else has, has ever done in the history of of, uh, of the planet uh, and so there's a, a kind of focus if you like on aspects of personal growth or goal-oriented growth uh, as opposed to transformation and a sense of uh, becoming, uh, you know, there's an, an innate character that we each um, are like an acorn and we turn into a, an oak tree or, or whatever it is that we're defined by. But there's a, you know, that's that's kind of different from a transformational, you know, we are we are what we achieve kind of approach. Um, and this really looks at, you know, kind of are, are we able to think through our communications in terms of, uh, the 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 surface level communication and what we can play with on a surface level and then those things which run deep which we 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 would find much more difficult to change and we play with it at our peril uh, because they are part of what defines uh, there's a there's a phrase that Joseph Campbell uses which is the mythogenetic and I, I I'm kind of concerned that there are um uh academic um ca- ac- academics media academics communications academics who want to de I, I was on a a, a a a seminar an online seminar and the phrase was used that they this particular group of academics wanted to de-westernize the curriculum and and uh, you know my thought was well what do you mean by that and it's always a good question to ask and what do you mean by that are you talking about the 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 the, the celtic tradition are you talking about the germanic tradition are you talking about the roman tradition are you talking about the hellenic tradition what you know exactly are you asking for the you know w- within this process because there are different things and this idea of mythogenesis is that there are kind of centres and zones uh, which define a, 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 a body of um, a, a symbolic framework for people who live in particular places. Uh, and with the caveat that in the last 50 years, we've become globalised, which we've never had before. You know, we, with this short breath of time that we have to look at some of these things on the basis of that, we have to remind ourselves that we were never globalised to this extent and in this way as we are now. Um, yes, there were elements of, you know, the Roman Empire was about people move. you know, there was, there was mobility, but it wasn't to the extent that we've got it now where you can jump on a plane and be on the other side of the world that you can pick up a you can communicate with people around the world instantly on on teleconference and or telephones or wherever it is you know we've never had that form of communication so there was always an element of um uh, lag and delay in terms of how things were absorbed into a culture now the culture washes in at this you know it's very it's 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 a an overload of information from cultures around the world which we don't have a chance to make sense of and orient ourselves around and at the heart of this there's a a concept about the you know the determination of whether there can be anything like truth and short of getting involved in a theoretical philosophical argument that i'm not equipped to um to to deal with going back to this notion of why i'm drawn to Kant and why I'm drawn to uh, people who followed on from Kant who sticks yes there are truths okay maybe we can't claim that there is an absolute truth and that uh, our experience of the world of the phenomenal world is defined by our experience and our capacity for experience and what we construct within that using our reason senses and intuitions and things like that however for 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 all intents and purposes these truths are important to us a matter and they can't be played with uh and i think part of the crisis of of communication and and is is this sense that and we see this being played out in politics and trump has played this um you know on on numerous occasions is that you can have alternative truths and it's kind of like well that devalues the process of you know it, it's that the, yes there are often exceptions to a rule 
Uh, however, that doesn't mean to say that the rules themselves are, uh, uh, you know, kind of not worth having. And uh, so that kind of completely open, deconstructive uh, process is unhelpful. Um, and a lot of our communications, it's about what that does is it generates a kind of cynicism. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't challenge kind of, if you like, power structures within the the symbolic structure itself. Uh, I do think that is um, is an essential thing for people to do. Uh, but it's on what basis do you do that? Anyway, so I'm, I'm kind of the, the, the f- theoretical philosophical model for this is not as straightforward as uh, many people would have us believe about our communications. And I think what we kind of need to do is look to things like, you know, the kind of patterns of behavior, the uh, we need to be observational, empirical about the kind of stages of, de- you know, cognitive development that we are able to pass through and that we, 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 you know, where are we in our society? What kind of stage of development are we at in modern UK society? What kind of uh, schemes do we have, um, schemas, you know, uh, roadmaps do we have that help us work our way through this? And ha- what happens if we stick to the, the plan too rigidly and we don't have any space for adaptation or change or growth? What happens um, about the way when people interact with each other and people of different experiences share different insights do we come up with new ideas how can we capitalize on that and not be afraid of using those new ideas so this idea of constructing knowledge is a very healthy thing and it's it's part of our innate capacity if we allow ourselves to do it but we do it in a way it's not it's not free for all it's not open-ended you cannot claim to have invented something that you haven't invented and it needs to be replicated and tested by other people. And that's a that's an established process, you know, kind of 500 year old process now. Um, and this is about kind of the way that we communicate through language is the way that we express our thoughts. And so it's important that we're able to just consider what we're doing when we're communicating or trying to communicate because it might not be you know the law of unintended and intended consequences it might not be what we we might not be achieving what we're trying to set out to achieve and we have to be open to the idea yes for the most part there will be patterns uh, which are well established pathways through which we can rely on but inevitably things change and things move forward and we have to look at things afresh and look at things differently um, so that's that's scratching the surface, um, and I hope I've uh, done some justice to explaining it. There is a lot more that we can uh, look at how these things work, um, and I'm really thinking, you know, this idea of uh, you know kind of impact assessments to make sure that we really do understand on what basis we are bringing people together through modes of communication, what we're trying to achieve, what the value is of that, what the resonance, the symbolic resonance is of different forms. What are our our assumptions within that? And and the danger for me is that we narrow our assumptions and, and make the assumption that everybody is interested in strictly come dancing or football or you know it's, it's not the case you know it's, it might be a large part of the population are involved in those things and apologies to anybody who I think you know I've upset by using those two examples but however you know let, how, how do we open things up and and how do we discover that and invent the new that's a good question to ask and for us to think about in the future because when we put together a strategy for communications you know being replaying the greatest hits regurgitating our assumptions from the past is 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 not going to be sufficient for the future and we need to think about okay what is it we're going to need to anticipate looking forward and what will our future generations need in terms of the the, the capabilities to communicate effectively in a world that is you know uh, uh, we think globalization is uh, you know rapid at the moment imagine what it'll be like in 20 or 30 years time it'll be you know unimaginable anyway if you want to get in contact with me uh 
you can do that via twitter and instagram at decentered media the website is decentered.co.uk i have a patreon account and if you su- wish to support me that would be gratefully achieved uh, uh, received you can start off at three pounds a month uh, it also helps you to get we, we do a regular uh, every fortnight we do a meet up and drop in where we could talk about some of these things, maybe not so lofty and philosophical as this, but we're going to be talking about ethics of communication, uh, hopefully in a future future meetup. And also, uh, you know, just a chance to share our experience, experiences and practice and find out what we should be thinking about with uh, and listening to one another's uh, uh, approaches to these things, which are always different and always illuminating. So, yeah, they just go to decentered. Uh, so go to patreon.com slash decentered media uh, and it just helps me to uh, to, to uh, keep my head above water and put out more more, more content uh, via the website anyway uh, I've spoken enough and I'll speak to you soon visit decentered.co.uk or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at decentered media